So Morella's exhibition was meant to open on Friday, and it, it worked out perfectly to have it open tonight instead. So after um, after her artist talk tonight, we'll walk over to the museum together, and the museum will be open until 8. So please come and celebrate her really exquisite exhibition. Um, that has not yet opened to the public, so you'll see it for the first time. Um, Morella's uh, exhibition is sponsored graciously by Collaboration Consulting, Meathead Movers, that gave us a lovely storage unit to put all the crates for the sculptures in, which is very necessary. <laughs> um, KSBY, Hotel San Luis Obispo, where Marilla has been staying all week, and uh, the city of Slo, of course. Um, tonight is meant to just you know be, a, be an artist talk. Marilla will talk about her work and her practice. Her practice is really inspiring and lengthy, so unfortunately our clicker is not working, so if you hear next slide, don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll carry on. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. We'll, um, she'll speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So um, if you think of anything, just chew on it, and we'll have time for that at the end. So without further ado, Morella, here is your microphone. I was telling them that it's like having a microphone is a new thing for me, so I have to get used to it. That makes me, makes me want to sing, and that's not what I'm good at. Um, <laughs> you don't want me to do that. You want to see that. Um, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm so grateful to be here and to be meeting so many of you. This community has been really welcoming. I mean, I've been here for a week and I went to the Latin, the Latino Outreach Council meeting in town hall and met all kinds of people who are doing things for the Latino community here. I met students from CalPAL from the Latinx group. I, I went to a concert and I've met so many of you, I, the sheriff, the mayor, I mean, in one week. And so I feel super welcome and you, you made me feel really special, um, especially because the Museum of Art, the San Luis Obispo Museum of Art, shipped 22 of my works from New York and Detroit to be here, which is huge. And I am just so honored to be here with them, with my works and see them together and share them with this community that I'm loving. Um, and yeah, so I'm just very happy to be here and to share my work with you, so. Um, and now I'll talk, to, I'll talk about what, what I brought. Um, well, as you now know, uh, my name is Marela Zacarias. I grew up in Mexico City. I was there until I was 17 in Coyacan, which is a neighborhood where Frida Kahlo lives, where Trotsky's house is. It's like a very kind of artsy, you know, little part of Mexico City, which is huge. And when I was 17, I left Mexico City to go to Ohio, to Kenyon College in Ohio. And I was the only Mexican there. And at the time, like all my friends were in a nub, like they were very active socially and politically. And I was alone in a beautiful, wonderful place where I found many friends. But I think a lot of my work being an immigrant and coming so young, like it made me really want to look at my roots and do research and represent my culture, you know, in my community. And so when I was studying there, I created a major social movement through art and religion. And I started, I became a muralist. I graduated and I said, I'm a muralist and I started painting murals. And I did that for 10 years. This is the sweet spot. I won't move. Um, and so for, for 10 years, I painted large public murals in the US, Mexico, Guatemala. A lot of them were community murals with students, uh, sometimes on my own. But I felt like mural painting was really encompassing the research, the community involvement, um, which was very important to me, and then giving back something to the public. And, and that was very rewarding until I kind of wanted to make my own work and, and have my own voice. And I felt like images were constraining me at that time. Whereas the muralists from the 1930s to the 1950s in Mexico, Diego Rivera, Orozco Siqueiros, were highly political, but in a time where that was accepted and that was part of the culture, when I was painting these murals, there was like a disconnect and I wanted to find kind of my voice, so I, I went to, I moved to New York, I was living in Connecticut. I moved to New York City to go to grad school at Hunter MFA. 
And when I was there, I was finally able to really have 24 hours, well, every day to figure out what I wanted to say or how I wanted to say it and to find my voice. And I think this brings me back to a theme that I think you're going to see throughout the work and in the show, which is like cycles of life and how, you know, you build these things and then they crumble and then you crumble and then you build them again, you know, and I feel like that happens a lot in our lives or in ideas or in what happens. But also for me, you know, that was a big moment of crumbling from this thing that I have been doing for 10 years and then seeing what was coming out, what was new and what was me. And so in, next slide, <laughs> and next slide. So um, when I was at Hunter, I painted one mural at University of Connecticut that was, had like this mother and child and like a shawl that went across and it was about colonization. And so it had some images of like the destruction of industry and, but then this shawl was uh, going across and he had a body and a presence and he was connecting the mother and the daughter and the future because it was kind of a timeline. And when I finished that mural, I was like, I don't need all these other images on top of it. I can only, like this sculpture and this painting and the shawl and its history and its connection generational from mother to daughter throughout centuries, the resilience that has been in the sculptures and the mother daughter love. And I was like, that's all, like that's what I want to talk about. And I think that's when my, my work started shifting in many different ways. For one, I became a sculptor, which I wasn't. Um, and also my work started going into the study of textiles in Latin America and I've done projects and around the world. Um, but also, oh, this is the sweet spot. <laughs> we should put like a little circle here. Um, and um, so you'll see a lot of development that happened through that, but also like about how my work is about what's next. It wasn't the Orozco's like, this is wrong with the culture and the universe, but my work is like, what is trying to share is like this new thing, this feeling of how does it feel like, you know, where do we want to go? And so this is the beginning of the works and this piece was for, you can keep going. Yeah, this was one of my first uh, site-specific installations and it was for the Latin American Biennial and Museo del Barrio in New York. And it was, you know, 38 feet long. And I want you to also look at, like, when I started painting, I was kind of thinking of patterns because in, in textiles you have the, the, you know, you are only working with a grid, uh, the warp and the weft. But, but as I develop my painting on these sculptures, like it just became paint, you know, painting, like painting on this surface, but I left the pattern. You can keep going. Uh, this was part of my show at my MFA in New York. And this is also, this was a show where I did a visit to the northern part of Mexico where my family's from and it used to be super safe and I went back there during the drug war in 2010 and it was like I couldn't leave the house you would hear the like shootings and like the environment had changed so much and so I did all these kind of playful pieces about absence and about seeing the you can keep going sorry the seeing the the playgrounds empty and like me trying to fill that with this presence but the presence was hollow I mean I love that, like, I feel like when I discovered this medium, my possibilities opened up so much because these images, although they are images, they have an entrance for everyone in a different way. And, and so it didn't have to be obvious what the works were about. They had to have that feeling in them, but people could interpret them differently, which I appreciated, and which is different from just a mural where you see image A plus B plus C. So it gave me freedom. It's, like allow me to sing, you know, and, and, and then everything else happened. So there was some sorrow and some stuff that was going on in that show. <laughs> Maybe. You, and also I've, I'm, I have all these other things that happened throughout my career, which is the small works and you'll see how they develop. And then murals, I, I mean, I've never really stopped painting in two dimensional surfaces or murals. They just didn't become that thing. Everything's kind of connected, but it's not like I 
you know, completely put that in the back drawer and never did it again. You can keep going. This is a, these pieces were made out of, with a silo, and this silo, to, in order to make them, they had too many in Vermont. And so we asked them if we could take them down, if they would give them to us for free, and they said yes. And so this is how we got our materials in Vermont. <laughs> it was very satisfying. Part of, the, part of the piece that nobody sees, but it was like, wow, I get to do this. This is, um, I've also had to say, like, I, I've been very lucky because I was in New York during the MFA and I was doing this new material, which, by the way, I found out I wasn't a sculptor because when I was in art school, I was like, I'm a painter, I'm a painter, and I do this and this. Like, I was kind of like not moving out of my idea. And once I, I started experimenting with materials, I didn't have all the background of a sculptor. And so I just went to the hardware store and started feeling materials like, oh, this could be cool. And if I mix this with this in a very intuitive way, like I didn't have training as a as a sculptor. And I just started making things at my studio. And thankfully, in the program, there were a lot of other sculptures, sculptors who helped me out when things were crumbling or when things were holding up. And they're like, well, maybe if you mix it with this or maybe if you use these. And that's how my, my artwork grew, also with the help of a lot of uh, our handlers. I am a super fan of our handlers because they're problem solvers and they have and they put that in my head now, you know. And so a lot of my work has been coming from collective intelligence and also my teams that I've developed. But this was my show at um, the Brooklyn Museum. So right after I had that show at Hunter and then the curator from the Brooklyn Museum came, Eugenie Tsai. And out of Hunter, I had the next spring, I had um, a show at the Brooklyn Museum, solo show, and it was inspired by the first abstract murals painted by the American abstract artist for the William, Williamsburg houses. So th at that time, that was the time of Diego Rivera and all of them, and it was all figurative work. And these artists were like in the avant-garde, like trying to paint abstraction for the workers. For, the, for their homes to like look at them and kind of meditate and, and they weren't very popular. So these murals got covered up and then eventually in the 90s they were rediscovered and then they were installed at the Brooklyn Museum. And I just really connected with this works. And so, and their story, again, there's a story of resilience, I think, in a lot of my projects of like how culture pushes through <laughs> and survives and, and, and people. Um, so these works were kind of climbing on walls and looking as if they were alive and just bringing back those murals. Um, that one was in my studio. And then from there I did this work at the um, American Consulate in Mexico. And for this work I did a lot of research about Mayan textiles and how, as I said, like mothers and daughters have been teaching you know, this technique, you know, from generations. And in their textiles, these women put all kinds of information about their town, where they're from, their family, what they believe in. And it's all in these textiles in the form of abstraction and color. And so to me, it was like, that's the way, like, you can do so much and put so much in there um, when it's just color and abstraction. And, and, and it, it, again, it's like an opening of, possibilities for me. And also, I love learning about many different things. And so these projects have continued to be a way for me to learn something new every time. So that's, you know, even, and then it all comes out together and becomes one, you know. So for this project, it was amazing. And I don't copy what I learned. Like, I definitely had all my references. and But then I let everything kind of come in and come out intuitively because that's important to me too, um, to be able to just create and be really present with the works. And that was one thing that didn't happen with murals too, like we had to put the whole image and then copy it and now it's all an intuitive process of making the sculpture and then painting on it afterwards. This is a work I did at, at, um, in Brooklyn, the William Vale, it's a big hotel. And, um, and so they were building this thing and they asked me to do this project and I decided to make it about the history of the place and how nature was there before and 
how it's transformed, but also the, the palette and the images that I use as resources were from Native Americans because that, that like Brooklyn used to be part of the Lenape. And so I didn't just do, looked at the work from Lenape because I, I needed a big, like I did a lot of, I, I, a lot of research in terms of what's been created, but I did want that force to be present in a space that is growing and we can't really stop it from growing. Like there's a nature in Manhattan and Brooklyn that is just gonna keep going. And so how can you be, we become part of it and how can we remember what was there before? And so in the middle of this fancy lobby, there's this like giant piece that it's also the, the shape of Brooklyn like the outside shape of, I mean, you can see only the top here, but it's the shape of Brooklyn kind of like taking over the space and, and reminding us of a presence that goes beyond what we have around us. And um, yeah, so that one's still there and you guys can visit it when you're in New York. Um, and then these are small works and small works, I'm always working with ideas or expanding. These were pieces inspired by um, Joseph Albers, how much to the square. These ones are called homenajes. And so I was practicing like kind of color and shape and form on these very organic forms. And that was fun. So I did that with some. And then we get to Cuatlicua uh, Returns, which is a work that you will see tonight. And it's here at the center. And <clears throat> so Cuatlicue is the goddess, the Aztec goddess of birth and, and destruction and rebirth. So it's like the cycle of life. And she's the the woman who, you know, creates all of that energy. And the story says that um, her, I mean, Aztec stories are very gory sometimes, and she was dismembered. And out of her members, like other gods came out. So she became many different gods, you know. And so the idea for this work, it was done in Detroit, where that cycle has been very evident in terms of its rise of industry and then all the industry leaving and poverty and now a new rebirth happening. And, but it's a very like evident, like it's, it's right up in your face how this is happening in that city. And, but also Diego Rivera painted these goddess on the murals that he painted at the at Detroit Institute of Art, which if you think about where I come from, like that was like the church, like Diego Rivera's murals there are incredible. And he painted her in one of the murals talking about the danger of technology and the danger of how industry could be really positive and help all the workers. And he had this very optimistic view of the world. But at the same time, it was, an, it was a warning about how industry and technology can turn dangerous, which is something that we're seeing today with, you know, this social media or with our phones or with um, the new uh, machine that talks to you and writes to you. And I don't know. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but, but exactly, like, so there's many good things. And, and I thought, so I thought it was very appropriate that these pieces coming back now and here in California to, you know, say hello to all of you, but also to remind us of these cycles. And for me, it's also a cycle, like this time, I mean, I'm in my 40s, but also having this show, I had to like look at everything I've made until today and we had to make some choices. And so it really made me think about my trajectory. So it's a really important moment for me, you know, in terms of what's next, integrating everything that has been happening and hopefully you'll see it in the works today. Here's an image real quick of the, the goddess, Cuatlicue, and then the one, the image on Diego Rivera's mural, and then my sculpture when it was still in white. So that's where it comes from. And all the, the pieces that you see at the show that are, have, are interacting with objects, you know, um, these pieces are made on crates. I got a lot of um, objects from Detroit, brought them to my studio, and then they made the works there. And so the crates were an important part of it because you can find all kinds of things on the streets in Detroit. So there's, you know, I wrapped a tire, and it's part of that, you know? And it's like giving a rebirth to these objects that were discarded because everyone left, you know, or because there's no one there. Yeah, here, here she is. And maybe, mm -hmm. 
So these works, the south wall and the north wall, are inspired by the palette where I'm, I'm using, I'm referencing the palette from Diego Rivera's murals, north wall and south wall. And whereas he was kind of painting what he saw in the industry, in the auto industry with all this optimism, um, I, I mirrorized these windows that came from an abandoned church um, in Detroit and I created the pieces on them. So because you're walking in front of it, you become part, you become the figurative aspect of the, of the mural by being in front of it. And it's also kind of distorted, which has also happened with the view of a muralist or of any artist is, you know, you're not objective. It's like all part of how you see the world. And so it talks a little bit, or, or that's what I was thinking when I made them, that there's a little distortion too. You can keep going with this. Oh, no. These are some small works. <laughs> what? Yeah. That was a mural I painted. I, I have the murals here and there so that you see that there's still that relationship. Like, I'm not afraid of a flat wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the curvy ones are, have become really interesting. These are all just uh, and then this project is a project that I finished in 2020, and there's, it's called Chalchitlique, who is the goddess of water as it collects on earth. And it's five different sculptures that are 50 feet by six and a half by six and a half, suspended above the baggage carousels at the new international arrivals um, airport in Seattle. And so anyone coming from an international flight has to come through the second floor. They see them down, they go down, and then they have to walk through these to get out of the airport. And uh, to make this work, I opened a studio in Seattle. I hired um, local artists to help me for 20 months. And um, these, each one is made out of 20 segments, 10 tops and 10 bottoms that click. And if you think about it, we made them on um, it's kind of a two poles and a beam, and then we put the segments and, and slide them in. And I'll show you a little bit of the process because I think it was pretty cool and pretty complex. And then you have to make sure that they all fit into each other, not just sideways, but the bottom with the other bottom. It's a lot of labor, a lot of time. All the works are handmade, hand sanded, hand painted. Um, and um, yeah. So these works are also there. Mm -hmm. This is how they were made. So I made these kind of um, saddles out of wood and then I would create, kind of plan the, the movement of the work and then build the mesh around them. You can, oh, you, if you push play, that one is a little, no? This one? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so that you see how I make the, the movement of the piece, of the sculpture. It, it's kind of like a gestural drawing. It has to be really fast because otherwise um, it just gets stiff. You know, it's like a drawing. You need to get it right the first time and then build on top of it. It takes like two months of building layers of plaster and sanding and adding things to harden it and then make sure that it fits, you know. But the, the first part needs to be really short. So these are some presses, like what it looks like. And then the team giving you layers and layers for months. These ones are ready for painting. And if you see like something that happened, because the works were, were about bodies of water around Seattle, I decided to, first of all, live there, open a studio, and then do go on walks around the, um, the Pacific Northwest to look at nature in different times of the year, different parts of it and then collect my palettes from, directly from nature and to have a variety. Because the first thing they said, make anything you want, but don't make it all gray. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, like, there's so many colors, you know, and gray goes great with all of them. Um, but, you know, so I collected the palette from there. And I think something that happened with the shapes is that they became even more organic. Like, the shapes of the sculpture start becoming more organic, and then the color palette that I gained from that experience was enormous. Like, I was just really looking at nature and, you know, kind of internalizing those colors and also having the opportunity to really put them out there in the world. Like, 
it was it was great great learning experience. Um, as you can see, everything is hand painted. Every single part of that is different. That that sculpture is different. I hand painted all of it. It was 18 hours of painting a day for many months. It was insane work, labor, and I had 13 people helping me. But they're all different and. You know, something that happened is like I had so much surface that I could play with that palette that I had chosen in so many different ways. And that was like a huge, it was like my, my masters in painting, you know, just like practicing and doing and yeah. And painting on three dimensional surfaces is incredible because every angle is a different painting. It's really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> So these ones are some videos you can just go. Yeah, you don't have to. Yeah, people are sending me these all the time now. I love it. If you ever go, you send me the. Yeah. Anyway, let's, yeah, let's. All right, this is a show I had a matter. Just so that you see, this was also murals. Um, but this one was at a time after the pandemic. It was, I had to do this show right after the summer of 2020 and I had a different idea and then the pandemic happened and I was in Mexico in Cuernavaca. And so I changed the idea for the show and I decided to make a replica of a pyramid that is at the site, Xochicalco, near where my family is in Cuernavaca. It's a place that we've gone a lot. My mom is an anthropologist. We, we've been going to that place, like, you know, like visiting church, but not quite, but, diff you know, but it's like a, a place that my mom has always felt very connected to. And it just so happens that this city was built when the Mayan and the Nahua empires collapsed. And they came together, like the people from both places, and created this city. But these were nations that were usually at war. And so this building is the building of the feather serpent where all the leaders would gather to like create the calendar and to make big decisions about the community. And it has this gorgeous uh, stone carving serpent outside of it. And so for me, it was like I came back to Seattle and I wanted to build this pyramid to represent kind of that idea of two sides that have been a war coming together and for me, coming back from Mexico again, I mean, sometimes you have these projects and this project keeps on unraveling in terms of meaning for me personally. But I also wanted to look at how a lot of American abstraction was inspired by textiles and, and Latin American architecture, indigenous architecture like Albers. And um, there's, there was a lot of that going on and I wanted to kind of reverse it and create a, a, something actually playing with that. So. The pyramid is transparent, but there's murals all around it, and you can see the color of the walls comes through from the murals. And also in the middle, there's a sculpture, anyway. But then what happened here is that I had been working with all these colors for the SeaTac Airport, and then when they came on these huge canvases, they're like 20, no, they're like 14 feet by 12 feet, they're huge. The colors organized so much. It's like I was using them in this way on the sculptures and then when I put them on the canvas and that happens a lot with me like things just rearrange in these ways that I'm like that where, where does that live you know but it does it's like this knowledge internal knowledge of the colors and yeah it was a, an incredible experience and these are some of the small works and some of them you will get to see at the, stu at, the, at the studio. Yeah, I call it the studio. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah. So these are just the other works that you can see a little bit range of. This is three works that become one. I think I, yeah. And that's my studio in Brooklyn. Anyway, I think let's just, yeah, and then maybe this will be the last one I talk about. This, this is called The Healing Shawl. And The Healing Shawl is a work that I did. It's a permanent um, installation for the NYU Langone Hospital in New York City on 53rd and Lexington Avenue in a building that used to be the, or is the City Corp building. But this is a, a place, it's a women's healthcare center that they just opened and they asked me to create a work for it. 
And because it was for women's health, I thought about telling the story of the shawl and how the shawl traveled um, you know, all over the world before he got to Mexico. And at some points it was like a luxury item and then it became a popular, something that people wore in like Italy and Spain. Um, and then it came to Mexico with the colonization and then all these indigenous communities adopted it and it became El Reboso, which most women wear a Reboso in Mexico. We all have one, you know? And there's this connection of it with the, carrying a child or getting warm or looking beautiful. You know, there's something about the shawl that women connect with. And men too, but there is a connection with, with women that goes, you know, back forever and throughout so many cultures. And usually the shawl is decorated with uh, the natural world, like plants or flowers, animals. And so I decided to do research on healing plants and flowers that help women's health. And I started learning, I mean, all plants are healing, it's incredible. But I did talk to some women who heal with plants and flowers and they gave me recommendations. And then I just waited for the form to kind of show up on the work. And, and so the healing shawl is now, um, you can look at it, it's on 53rd and Lexington Avenue. And one of the women who's worked for me and she's a great friend of mine, she was pregnant, she didn't know, no, was she pregnant? I think she already knew she was pregnant. Anyway, when we went to the opening, she's like, I'm, I'm giving birth here. Like she, that became her doctor's place. So there's that, this beautiful thing. And you can see it from the street, from the atrium, and people can come in and see it up close. But these also, it's like, it's still following that path. And it's just interesting how you start doing one thing, like the SeaTac airport, and nature became part of me. And I earned all these colors and my shapes start to get you know, very organic, then here I am actually thinking and painting plants and flowers. Like there's a cempasuchil and there's a hibiscus flower and a reference to the petals of a rose, you know what I mean? And now that has taken me to another path, which is really looking at plants and my painting has become a lot more organic. And, you know, it's just, I feel like it's a, there's a very linear growth and movement in my work that can, be easily traced, but it's always unexpected for me. Can we, when I did this, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> These are just some shots of my studio while I'm painting. Should we have any questions? Yeah, let me just say one thing about that first painting. Yeah, that was the, the first actual canvas I painted in a long time, and it was for that same lobby of the healing shawl. They wanted something else on another wall, and I was like, well, I'm not gonna make another sculpture, but I'll make a painting. And I made a painting using the color palette of the healing shawl, which is so organic and so, so it's just interesting, again, like how things translate on the two-dimensional surface. And I think I'm gonna keep doing that as I grow because it's a very, there's a really nice communication that feeds each other. Yes, let's have questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you. Uh -huh. I love all the colors and the creativity. It's just fabulous. Have you ever thought about doing textiles? Every time I saw one, I thought, oh, I want that in the scarf. I want that in the shell. They're beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not very interested in making them into textiles, but I think it would be easy for other people to make them into textiles. Like, it's not the textile that interests me as much as the idea of the textile and how it interacts with the sculpture. Um, and also textiles have the warp and weft, and that's not my cup of tea, but I could see them becoming other things for sure. Yeah. Sounds like a licensing opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I had a, I opened a studio in Seattle, hired artists there to help me, got a team together, like 13 people for 20 months, and we built them. So we would build like one and a half sculptures at a time, 
And then as soon as that was like, we would make the sculpture, I would start painting it, then we finished painting it, then we would create it, put it in storage, and then kept going. And like, it was. Well, we took them all to storage, and then it took forever to install them because of the pandemic. So that, and then they yeah, took them all to SeaTac and installed them there all at once. And they must weigh a lot. They don't. They are. So the wood frame goes away. The, no, the wood frame is the weight, really. Because then you have, you have the mesh and the plaster, but we've gotten so much better at my technique that I've, we've developed that it's hard, but it's light, because it's hollow, basically. Um, so they are, you know, four people have to carry one because also it's really big and it's very organic, you know, it's like, um, but they're not that heavy. And that's why I do a lot of our, like projects with architects and engineers, because I can do really massive works that are made into like 25 different segments that hang on a cleat. I just have to bring a map of cleats and we put them up like in no time. Like that's the easiest part of my work, even though it looks complex. Mm -hmm. yeah, how do you, you keep the surface smooth? Sanding. <laughs> Left hand, right hand, <laughs> and underneath and above and sand a lot of labor, a lot of physical labor. Mm -hmm. Over there we had a question. Yes. Um, I'm Mexican, I'm from Oaxaca. So proud of you. I love you. Gracias, gracias. And, um, um, one question is, I know that the culture, um, the life that you had in Mexico, your family, plays a huge factor in your art. So when you're hiring artists, like for example in Seattle, do you take in con consideration like it has to be someone that has the Mexican background? Or well, not necessarily. I mean, in New York, I remember I had a big project and I was hiring people and most of the people were like recent college graduates that were not, you know, of color. And, and so I called some of my friends, my artist friends, and I was like, hey guys, can you recommend some students that are Latino, black, because I, I, you know, I don't want to just give this opportunity, which is not mine. I mean, the, coming, the money from a project comes from here and goes out here, you know, it's like going to the people that are and and so they did and, and and now i have only two guys in brooklyn and one of them is who came then recommended by my puerto rican friend but but it's because he was also the best and and is still there and you know like we've connected but also i have a team in mexico of all mexicans and i felt like in seattle in seattle i opened it up we, I, we did bring michael who's like my main fabricator and um, he's half Puerto Rican and half Ecuadorian, but grew up in Brooklyn. And we brought uh, Estefania, who's Puerto Rican, from the New York team to also teach everyone else. And uh, in Seattle, but in Seattle, like diversity was also very different. It was also, we had class diversity and we had um, a lot of um, non I mean, it was just like, we had, Asians, we had, yeah, we had like a lot of different people, but I didn't find a lot of Mexican artists to work on that project specifically, but I feel like that is in other parts of the work, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. The hardest process. <clears throat> well, it's all labor intensive, but I think it depends, you know, it depends on if it's like a huge project, like organizing the whole long term project. That was a hard thing that like I l learned, you know, it's not it doesn't come natural to all artists to lead a, gr a team and for 20 months and run, a, a you know, be a manager. Like that's not, I'm a friend, <laughs> like it, 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 that, that's been something that I've had to like learn how to like embody better. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I love making them. I don't see any of it as, it's like when you're raising a child, like, yeah, they might get in a bad mood once in a while, but you love all those parts of it too. I love the challenge of new places, new stories to tell. 
and how to unravel that and make it into a work. But, but that challenge, I also don't see it as hard. I don't know. I, I'm reluctant to say anything is hard, but it is, all, all of it is really hard. <laughs> Mm. I think I just see it on the work. I, I paint instinctively, um, and I see the line, and then I see the other line, and I feel the color, like I pick up the color, and I know that I need something warmer or lighter. It's very intuitive. So even though it looks like it's very, but then you see what happens to me when I do two-dimensional. Like it becomes really like sharp, and there's an order in it. So the order exists, but when I'm painting on the pieces, I'm just reacting to the form and seeing line and color emerge, and I just follow it and make it work. Hmm? You're not making marquettes beforehand, then? No, never. Just a follow up to that. So, when, whether the piece is small or whether it's a, a segment, once the form is finished and you are going to apply the paint, you do not envision a general concept of how the paint will lie on the on the piece. You just start at one end and. Well, I usually, it, that's changed, like for the SeaTac airport, I would make a, like a pattern with tape, really thin painting tape. And so I would make my whole, I, I was like a um, spider, like going through the piece, like putting lines and seeing, but I'm seeing those lines on there already, I'm just putting the tape. And then I would start with a color, I had maybe chosen a palette for each piece, depending on what, I, what, what body of water I was referencing. So maybe I had like 39, 40 colors um, that I wanted to maybe use. And then I would start with one seeing and then another. And then it just becomes a painting, but it's just a three-dimensional ginormous painting, you know? But, but I just play with it. And, and it's like painting. Any painter can tell you, like, you know when it's working, you know when it's not working, you know when it needs something else. And I know when it's done, you know? Like, I feel like, OK, done, oh, maybe. <laughs> But, but there's definitely an order of each piece. They have their own order that we, you kind of like uncover. You know, They're like puzzles, I feel like, in some ways. Thank you. Yeah. So um, you said that you learned to be a project manager. Like, how did you do that as an artist? And like, were there any specific tools that you used? Oh, yeah, I should write a book. Um, well, I always was in, the, in, the, in terms of being a mural painter. Because when you're a mural painter, you're also using having a team you have to be working with a nonprofit organization that has many different arms and how to get paid and how to get the, you know, so that started when I graduated from college and I was 21, you know, and each project got better and the teams and how to teach and how to put together ideas with many other people and how to integrate them and create something and finish even under the rain and the sun and, you know, like, so I feel like that made me kind of start with the concept and become really resilient and hardworking um, because you're outside and, and it's you know, tough work. And then as I've developed these other projects, they just become more complex. There's more money involved, there's more, you know, and you're creating these, these, these things. But I feel like being able to work with people, I love people, I like teams, I'm very social. So that, was, that came easy, but you do need to organize like payroll and you know what I mean? All of that part has been the one that is not always my favorite, but then you hire a project manager and then they can hopefully deal with that part um, better, depending on the budget. But now I'm so happy just being small and having just two, two people to work with and I'm basically just painting everything and I'm enjoying time, personal time with the works by myself. And who knows, you know? Mm -hmm. I have a question because I love the, the title of the show that Emma and you chose, Storytelling. And so I wanted to go back a little bit in your process because I know it well. But uh, for people, is that when does the, you do so much research about the narrative, about the storytelling, and then you get into form and paint. But could you speak a little bit, when do you feel that you have that story and you want them to express it? How does it go that you move from that stage to the other? I think it's like there is something about 
like someone, when they asked me to do the piece for the healing shawl, you know, I had all these things in my mind, like the themes, and then all of a sudden I saw it, you know, like it's a shawl. And then you go in and you do the research and then the piece comes to life. So I feel like there's, there's a moment when you're like putting all this information where like something, you have to learn how to see it, like how to, and, and you see it, you know, you're like, oh my God, this is it. Like, this is where I want to go. This is kind of the concept, overall concept. This is the opportunities to learn. These are the, you know, it's, there's something very intuitive about it too, but it wouldn't come if you were not doing all the research and putting all the information in. And so, you know, part of it is when someone asks you for a piece for a special place, I do all the, like, I try to find out as much about that place and then there's something that shines. And then the more I do research on that, the more I'm like, of course, this is what the project is about already. You know, like it just, and those are usually the projects that come through because they, I, I get asked about many different things and some of them fit and some of them don't, but the ones that where that clicks, you know that it already, you know, that it's gonna happen kind of because it has that magic. Yeah. How many projects do you have on your list that are coming in the next 10 years? <laughs> well, for the big projects, I definitely have, no, it, like 1% for the arts is something that like they get you and then it's like four years of development. And um, so I have like maybe three projects like that, but it's not huge. And it's also because I've been a lot less, a lot more hesitant about saying yes to huge large, large projects. I don't, I'm not dying to do one. I don't want, like, I really enjoy working on the individual works and having, and these projects like Chalchit Likwe, like, requires so much from me. I have a child and, you know, I, I think that when you're working so hard on these projects, it's taking life away from you and so you better choose a good project to put that energy into. So I'm choosing less big, I'm not looking for the big, you know, like people contact me and we talk and then maybe if it fits right, but I don't, I don't need to do anything bigger than what I did for SeaTac, yeah. ever. <laughs> like that was blood and tears and sweat and nights and time away from my son. And, you know, I did it with a lot of love for the people in Seattle, the people there for my country, for the international community, for, I don't know, because I felt like it was meant to be there but it needs to be that special for me to put all of that in there. Good for you for not selling out. <laughs> <laughs> Knock on wood. Who knows? <laughs> well, I'm sure there are many more questions that all of y'all have, and we will have plenty of time to talk to Morella back at the museum. So um, we do have to get out of this space, so whole, I know you'll want to line up and ask her all sorts of things. Just make your way through the mission into the warm and welcoming museum where there's wine and music and you all have all of Yes, I would love to, to yeah, say hello. Well said. Yes. So, Thank yeah. you so much for being here and asking such great questions. And like, woo!